Um, so while you guys are coming in, we're going to start with a quick, very important message from our new AI overlords. We're going to have a quick listen to that, and then after that, we'll start with the actual presentation. Good day yes. to you. I am the TNG Technology Consulting PowerPoint Karaoke Generator, but you can call me Joanna. Today, we're going to talk about the important topic, why AI should write your keynote talk. When it comes to giving a keynote talk, you want to engage and interest your audience as much as possible. This is where AI can help. AI can help you write a more engaging and interesting keynote talk by understanding what your audience is interested in and what will resonate with them. Additionally, AI can help you choose the right words and phrases to use in your talk to make it more impactful. By using AI to write your keynote talk, you can be sure that you are giving your audience the best possible experience. If you're giving a keynote talk, you want to make sure that your audience is engaged and invested in what you're saying. After all, a keynote is supposed to be a motivating and inspiring speech that gets people thinking about your message long after the talk is over. So how can AI help you make sure that your talk is tailored to your audience? For one thing, AI can help you analyze your audience and figure out what they're interested in. By understanding their demographics, interests, and needs, you can make sure that your talk hits all the right points. Additionally, AI can help you keep track of how your audience is reacting to your talk in real time. This way, if they start to look bored or confused, you can adjust on the fly and keep them engaged. In short, AI can be a valuable tool for making sure that your keynote talk is exactly what your audience needs to hear. By helping you understand them better and giving you feedback in real time, AI can help you customize your talk to ensure that it's impactful and memorable. AI can help you make your talk more persuasive by providing data-driven insights into what your audience is most likely to respond to. For example, AI can analyze past speeches and identify patterns in the most successful ones. It can also take into account the demographics of your audience and tailor your message accordingly. By using AI to guide you, you can be sure that your talk will be more persuasive and impactful. Thank you for listening to this presentation about why AI should write your keynote talk. If you have some questions, please type them into the questions box. Do we have any kind of questions to our new AI overlords? If not, well, think of them during our talk. Uh, if you found this talk a bit boring, we have a couple more. Like all of this for, for your information was generated by AI, the text, the slides, the images, everything. And um, so we also have a very interesting talk about why Java devs should drink on the job. Uh, you might find that interesting, so stick around after our yeah. talk. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, yo, <laughs> the conference here in London, it's nice to be here and welcome to our closing keynote talk. It's all about artificial intelligence, promises and challenges in computer vision and NLP, natural language processing. So, um, yeah, let's start. Before we start, we want to introduce ourselves, of course. So. We start with this smart guy here. This is Thomas. Okay, Thomas. my name is Thomas, uh, Thomas Andres. I study computer sciences and after my studies, I joined the my current company, the TNG. And uh, for the last nine years or so, Ten. we've, well, or so. something like that, we've been working on innovative prototypes, things that no customer could, should ever use or ever wants to use, but uh, they are cool. So that's good. Yeah, and uh, right. With me, I have Martin. Yeah, Martin Furch is my name. I've studied computer sciences and applied sciences. And uh, yeah, we are typically stealing or we get inspired by yeah, science fiction movies with our innovative projects. And we want to show you some of our developments today. And with us is Jonas Meyer. Yeah, so my name's Jonas. Uh, you can see I also have like a couple of very cool titles here, just as the other guys. And uh, yeah, I've been working with TNG for four and a half years now. I've been working in the so-called innovation hacking team that we're going to talk about a little bit soonish. And with that, I've been involved with like pretty much all the fun little projects that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So with that out of the way, Martin, what is the innovation hacking? The innovation hacking, yeah, this is, um, you can see it here. It started in 2013. We controlled the yeah, quadrocopters with bare hands based on 3D cameras here. We had a uh, Terminator vision, which, which you can see the world through the eyes of a Terminator. Here, a uh, gesture-controlled now robot, yeah, based on uh, the Kinect camera back in the days, or Star Wars-like telephone calls with the HoloLens and stuff like that. So this is what we're typically working on. 
And you might ask yourself, okay, why do you do that? Uh, there are a few yeah, uh, yeah, ideas behind that. So we want to gain new skills, of course, and we want to inspire people. So thank you that you are here and uh, we hope we can inspire you today. And last but not least, because. 10% of our working time, we are yeah, uh, allowed to work on projects we like to work on. And uh, yeah, this is our yeah, content today. We want to speak about AI today. And I want to start with a question to the audience. So what has this picture in common with this picture? Anyone an idea? No? Okay, so... These are pictures which are artificially generated, yeah, based on uh, mid-journey. And it's a text to image AI, a deep neural network. You put a text in and this comes out. Now you might ask yourself, okay, what was the input for the first picture? So this was an oil painting of Obi-Wan Kenobi. This was the input and this is the mid-journey output. Let's have a look to this picture. The input here was Jesus at the steering wheel of a Ford Mustang. <laughs> what? Let's have a look to another one. <laughs> Guess what? Boris Johnson with a red Pinocchio-like nose. Okay. One. one more. Only one. One more. Okay. One more. Who can guess this one? <laughs> Who can guess this one? It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. <laughs> Jesus winning a dance battle against the super devil in a moody black hip-hop club mosh pit with cinematic lighting, 1920 colorized. <laughs> so you can see we shifted our focus from 2013, uh, where we worked on 3D cameras, robotics, VR, AR, and stuff like that. We moved our focus to AI. And this is what we want to talk about today. So let's have a look to the agenda. We start with artificial intelligence, computer vision in a nutshell, neural real-time style transfer, real-time deepfakes, natural language processing. We've implemented an AI creating shit posts for reasons. And last but not least, a conclusion. So let's start with artificial intelligence in general. So it was coined back in the days in the 50s. And artificial intelligence is yeah, engineering of machines that mimic yeah, human behavior, cognitive functions or something like that. Yeah? So it's just a huge bunch of if-then-else statements. Then in the 80s, machine learning yeah, is the ability to perform tasks without an explicit uh, in instruction. So in other words, um, it's relying on patterns and if-then-else statements. And since yeah, the 2000, yeah, 2006, the deep neural network was invented. Yeah? And um, yeah, it's, it's machine learning basically uh, on this yeah, kind of stuff. You will learn today how it works. And uh, there are probably also some if-then-else statements in some of those yeah, so software projects today. <laughs> so let's have a look to the history, to the AI timeline. So the, the term was co coined in 1950s, and then there was a huge development going on. So uh, you can see here um, Eliza, the first chatbot in the 50s, 60s, uh, invented by Joseph Weizenbaum. Then there was the AI winter in the 70s, 80s. And so on and so on. In 2006, as I told you, um, deep neural networks were invented. And from this uh, point on, there was such uh, development going on. Uh, you have it in your daily life, like using Alexa and stuff like that. Yeah. So let's have a look to one of the first chatbots in the world. 1966, invented by Joseph Weizenbaum. It was Eliza. And um, yeah, it was um, yeah the, the press when they discovered Eliza, they were really um, how to say um, amazed. Uh, it could uh, replace a therapist or something like that. Yeah, and uh, Eliza is just asking you something like, um, 
is something troubling you. So Jonas just entered the, uh, the, the sentence, I'm talking at your conference. So Eliza said, says, what does that suggest to you? Okay, so Jonas, please be creative, answer something uh, which fits to Eliza's output. Um, so what does that suggest to you? Uh, Jonas is um, writing that I'm on a stage. Eliza says, that is interesting, please continue. One more and then we will stop. Jonas is just typing something in, let's have a look. <laughs> Okay, Jonas types, I have to type random stuff and pretend like I'm having a conversation. Eliza says, that's quite interesting. Now, my question is to you. Do you think that this feels like a real conversation with a human? No? Yeah. <laughs> let's have a look on that. So, how does that really work? Yeah. So, um, let's take this example sentence. I must say you are a robot. This is our input for Eliza. What happens now? Step two. We do some yeah, pattern matching again. So we match the user input to a rule pattern. So we have some array with rules or something like that. And then you can see blah, 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 blah. You are blah, 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 blah. Perfect. This matches to our input where we say, I must say, you are a robot. And then we pick a response for this specific rule. And then you could say, what makes you think that I'm a robot? Or do you sometimes wish you were a robot? Yeah, and then you've got the output. Does it please you to believe I'm a robot? So in the 60s, this was a huge thing. But in the 70s, there was the first AI winter. Money, conferences, everything was canceled. There was a slight peak in the 80s for expert systems, and then there was a second AI winter. And now we're having some kind of a boom, and the question we have, yeah, the question we have, praise yourself, is the next winter coming? And we want to answer that question, maybe today. <laughs> and um, for this, we have a lot of showcases for you today, live showcases. And we want to start with computer vision in a nutshell, because we want you to understand how a deep neural network yeah, processes graphic. Yeah, but uh, before we do that, let's have a quick look at computer vision. So what is computer vision? Yeah, computer vision is in AR everyday life. You do it when you put on a funny uh, dog um, face or if you scan your uh, face and uh, do a face detection or also if you do simple tasks like QR codes or everything, there is basically computer vision. And computer vision can be done in multiple ways. And there are traditional ways doing it algorithmically and there are the new ways doing it using deep neural networks. We will explore both of them. So first of all, let's have a quick look at a, one example, face detection. Face detection is a very common task in computer vision and you have to do it a lot, actually, uh, because you need it a lot. And uh, before the neural networks, there were things like hard cascades. So basically what you're doing here is uh, you have a face. So this is a stylistic face here. You have two horizontal lines in your face, also called eyes. And then you have a vertical line, your nose, and you have another horizontal line underneath your nose, which should be your mouth. So this is a very simple representation of your face. And um, hard cascades do exactly that. They try to uh, see some patterns in the image which resemble a face. And we're doing this by doing two things. So first of all, we have the normal image. Then we uh, do a bit more lighting to the image so that everybody looks this person looks like an angel or something like that. And then we have a, uh, we apply less lighting. And as you can see, with all these different uh, images that we have, uh, different patterns emerge. So for example, in the overlighted situation, you have something like the eyes pop out a little bit <coughs> and uh, where the person is a bit underlighted, we have some other patterns. And then we try to match them. So here you, we have some more features as we had before. So we have the line features that we had before and we can just 
match them onto the face or we also have these edge features um, and things like uh, from the bottom left to the upper right, uh, which is in this case also called four rectangle features. And then we can just uh, take the image and match horizontal edges or lines and things like that. And uh, there is, uh, you can then describe how a face looks like. So for example, like what you can see in this image here. And we try to match it as closely as possible to the image that we have at hand. And with that, we can then say, okay, this is a face. And this is basically how it works. But all of this is basically handcrafted. How a face looks is not really uh, learned or something like that. It is uh, crafted by an engineer. And we'll have a look at how good that works now in our next live demo. And here you can see Jonas, yeah, his face is recognized. Martin is also recognized, but as you can already see, in some cases we had already cases where hands were detected as faces and in some cases it, nothing is detected at all and uh, it's, it's getting really confused. So it, work, it works pretty well, but not perfect. So let's try to make that a little bit better. And we are doing this with AI. So now that we've seen how the traditional uh, thing works, let's see how neural networks work. So neural ne networks are basically inspired by nature, like pretty much everything else. And what we are doing here is we are trying to mimicking the behavior of a neuron. A neuron is a, a cell which is connected to other cells and which exchanges information via electric stimuli. And uh, we are doing this with um, so-called activations and um, if you, uh, so, so we gather the input from all of the surrounding um, neurons and then we try to see if this passes a certain threshold. And if this passes a threshold, then there is an action potential, which means that the cell fires, electric signals get propagated to the next cell. And um, if it does not exceed the threshold, we have a failed initiation and nothing fires at all. And there was some extremely intelligent person who thought, hey, we can do this and we can uh, put it into a mathematical model. And this looks something like we have here. So we get the input from our um, previous cell and then we can put a weight on that. So if the information from that cell is important or if it is not important. And then we can also apply a bias. A bias is basically there for whether this, uh, this neuron is particularly reactive. So if it likes to fire away for the next cell or if it does not like to fire. And then we put an um, activation function on it. Activation function basically means in the form of a, a human neuron, it would just be a threshold function, a cutoff function. So uh, either it fires or it doesn't fire. In other cases, we could also have other activation function. And um, in normal neural networks, we do not have these uh, cutoff functions because they are not <laughs> easy to differentiate. Okay, so let's uh, see this in a bigger picture. So these are now three input neurons that we have with uh, different weights. And we put all of our money and effort into this beautiful animation, which you can see here. And uh, as you can see now, some of the weights are below one, some are above one. So these get either uh, more important or less important than the other information. We sum up all the information that we get from the previous inputs. We add the bias, then we put on uh, the activation function. In this case, it's not a cutoff function anymore, but a rectified linear unit. Uh, which is basically just a linear function. And then we pass on that information to the next neuron. All right, so now let's see how our um, face detector works if we just try to do that with neural networks. So first of all, we have to guess some number. We get some numbers because our inputs are always numbers. But that's pretty easy. So we can just take the grayscale values of our input. A white uh, pixel might be a 1.0 and a black pixel a 0 0.0 and everything else is just something in between. And then we take 
one row of this image and we use this one row as an input to our neural network and then the next row and then the next row and then the next row and so on and so on. This is the easiest way of how to put this into an input vector, which is also not the most realistic one, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll keep it like that. And uh, then we can just connect each and every input value to each of and every neuron in the first layer of our network. This is a so-called fully connected layer now because yeah, every input is connected to every neuron here. And then we'll connect every neuron in layer one to every neuron in layer two, and then same with layer three until we reach a final output. And if we have done everything correctly and we have a face as an input, then we will get a high number as an output, which basically means in this case that we have detected a face. All right. So same thing for something that is not a face. And uh, we put in the information again and again, and we go through the layers. The important thing here is in the first layers, we detect so we can only um, differentiate between different simple shapes. So something like these uh, features like a horizontal line, vertical line, something like that. So this is what we can do, differentiate in the first layers. And the deeper we go, the more sophisticated the patterns become until we reach our face. So in this case, it should say something like 0 0.223. So this is not a face, it's a duck. Um, but if we don't train our neural network, we'll get something like, oh, this is really a good face and um, our neural network will be happy, but we will not be. So what we will have to do is we'll have to train our neural network. And as every good parent knows, um, training a neural network is best done with punishment. And we're trying to punish our neural network now. And we can do this with a cost function because money is always the best punishment. And uh, we are doing this by just uh, taking the difference between the real value and the value that we got so in, in the output layer. Um, and uh, because we know what is a face and what is not a face. And then we are squaring that up, summing it up. And this is our cost now. So what we are doing here is, um, in this case, uh, this is a face, but it also said it is a face, so that's good. And our cost function is therefore something like 0 0.03, and we're happy with it. If we have duck, then our best guess would be that this is not a face, so 0 0.0. .0. And um, our neural network now detected that it is a face. So if we just do our maths, we get a cost value, which is 0 0.67, which is high, and therefore, we can then deduct that we need to train our neural network. But what does training mean? So we are now trying to find an optimization method with which we can bring our neural network to closer to what we expect. And uh, this can be done by two things. So in our mathematical models, we had the weights. So we can just adjust that a little bit, like a little knob. Uh, and we can also adjust the bias. And with these values, we can then just play around, tune them a little bit until everything's fine. But unfortunately, it's not that easy because normally we have in our neural networks things like something like that. So millions or trillions of different, weight, different weights and biases. And that just playing around, you will never get to something which is good enough. So what we'll have to stick to is something that we really want to avoid at any cost, but in this case, it's, it's not possible, so we'll have to do some math. But, um, and this is called gradient descent, which is uh, a bit too complex for this keynote, so we're just going to skip it. All right. Um, next thing, let's have now a demo, right? Yeah. Let's have a look at uh, a neural network that actually works for once. So what we have here is a so-called VGG19, which is a classification network. And it doesn't just tell us like whether we see a face or not, or but more like which of a bunch of hundred classes we are seeing right now. So right now you can see it's seeing a sweatshirt and a television, which is the most accurate prediction ever. If I put my phone in here, 
will tell you it's an iPod, which kind of also tells you how old this neural network is. <laughs> yeah, people still had iPods back then. And then we also have a few... A vending machine. Yeah, what, wonderful. Uh, hairspray, cellular phone. Yeah, that, that, that sounds about... Maybe accurate. I place with my lab coat in front yeah. of the camera. Let's try that. Yeah, you can see it's awesome. It the lab coat, doesn't know what a... I have a stethoscope, so my lanyard is a stethoscope. Yeah, it works. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And so what, is, what exactly is the VGG19, Thomas? Yeah, so VGG19 is one of uh, a layered network like we had before in our example. So it consists of 19 different layers. That's also why it's called VGG19. And uh, these are not fully connected layers like we had before, but so-called convolutional layers. But uh, the basic principle is still the same. You put in uh, a picture at the beginning and then uh, the first layer detects simple shapes the layers that are further in just detect more advanced shapes. And at the end, you have an output, which is basically just, um, it tells you how um, likely the image is, uh, um, is supposed to be a cat or a dog or a frog or something else. And this is about it. But we can also just visualize the features that we see in this image. Exactly. So there's a thing which is called deep dreams. And those people who have been attending uh, Dylan's keynote yesterday, they will know that. Uh, so we can basically visualize what exactly the neural network sees. So we're going to start out with just an image of myself. It's going to take a while to start up. Let's see. Uh, there we go. So we took an image of myself and we just run it through the neural network and tell it basically whatever you saw in this one layer, just increase that. And so we're just going through a different bunch of layers. And you can see in the beginning, we're seeing some features that kind of look like eyes and feathers and stuff, not really something that is uh, a whole object. And right, what is happening right now is we're going through the layers. We're going deeper and deeper and deeper. And you can see the features that are coming out. They're getting more and more concrete. You can see now we have some weird dog monkey hybrids in here. <laughs> and you will also see some, well, you can also see a very weird dog and some like snake egg fish hybrid in there. So what, what it's basically learned is to well, differentiate between well, dogs and cats and all of that. And the features that it's learned kind of look like cats and dogs, which is quite fun. So you can play around with this. You can just zoom in forever. Uh, it's quite trippy. But I think at this point, we don't have a whole lot of time. So we're going to carry on with the very important topic Yes, of neural style transfer, isn't that right? Neural style transfer, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Let's have a look to that. What's that? Yeah, neural style transfer. So um, here we have a very beautiful painting of Van Gogh. It's a starry night, yeah. And uh, let's have a look to another beautiful picture. This is a, a photo I took uh, uh, yeah, in the USA. This is Mesa Arch and Canyon Lens. And um, yeah, what we do right now, can we just fade the Mesa Arch? Yeah, to a Van Gogh like painting. So it looks like that Van Gogh was actually at the Mesa Arch. That's amazing. Uh, so this is called style transfer. So uh, in the next slide, we can see what it actually means. So we have a picture, a photograph, a photo, and uh, we have this painting. So we extract the style of the painting, we apply that to our uh, input photo, and then we have some, some, some kind of a pastiche. And the inventor of that um, uh, has this website, deepart.io, and you probably know that from other apps like Prism and stuff like that, uh, yeah, you can do uh, uh, style transfer there, there as well. And uh, yeah, at TNG we worked on that uh, and we made it real time. Yeah. So how does a style transfer work? Yeah. So this is a, a picture of an autoencoder and uh, on the left side you have the encoder with the input image. This gets translated to some kind of a latent space representation, which actually means yeah, in this photo there is uh, some kind of an arc uh, and uh, a sky and something like that. And um, yeah, this is a bottleneck architecture, and then we reconstruct that image with, and the output will be the restyled image. So now the question is, it, it's every time, every time it's uh, all about cost and cost functions. So how does that work here for the style transfer? We have different kinds of loss functions, for example, the content loss. So when I take a photo of the real world and I re restyle that, 
I play, I apply another style on that, then it's definitely clear that we have some kind of information loss. Yeah, that's clear. So let's have a look how we can calculate the so-called content loss. The content loss is uh, dependent uh, on the localization inside the image. So let's have a look to this specific extract here in the photo. Um, you can see some kind of a curve from the upper left to the bottom right. And uh, we take an iteration of our restyled image. And uh, of course, it looks a bit different here. And uh, this is what we expect, by the way. And uh, we spoke about those features today. And let's have a look. If we take our features yeah, to rebuild um, this, yeah, to apply them uh, to our iteration of the style transferred picture. And now you can have a look to the activation of those specific features. And they are different. They are just different. And now you can take just these numbers. You can use the coast function, which uh, Thomas already introduced. And then you can use that to, to train your deep neural network on style transfer. So there is another thing going on uh, for style loss. Um, uh, to make it short, you just have a look in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the style picture, in the painting. And then there are, for example, stars like in the painting here. Uh, and you look for those uh, feature activations on those stars uh, uh, in the styles transferred picture. Okay, this is, uh, can be used for the cost function as well. That's clear, but now let's have a demo. This is a picture by Giacomo Bala, and it's uh, yeah, called Pessimism and Optimism. And now Jonas is starting the live demo, and hopefully he will have, yeah, he appears as a real-time style transfer. Isn't that amazing? So a deep neural network is just taking the video stream right now and restyles all those incoming frames in real time. Awesome. So, of course, we don't only have this uh, style. So let's switch through that. So here we have um, a painting um, um, which was originally very, very, uh, how do we say? Um, abstract. Abstract, yeah. So uh, abstract input here in this case means abstract output. Let's have a look to another style or just switch through them. And we prepared some, yeah, this is the Starry Night style. Um, can you please switch to the, sum, uh, to the style, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the audience should I guess from where this style, where is this style, style from? <laughs> ah, <laughs> yo! <laughs> du, 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 du. Yeah, so back in the days in the 80s, they paid hundreds of thousands of US dollars yeah, to make this video possible. And nowadays, it's just this, uh, yeah, piece of cheap hardware uh, doing the stuff uh, while Jonas is just uh, in front of the camera. Isn't that amazing? By the way, Jonas back in the days was an intern and we asked him for another appearance in London. Hey, can you please train the deep neural network with something which fits to London? Let's see. So, and Jonas, uh, oh. <laughs> this happens if you ask an intern to do things. Yeah, one week yeah. later we had a conference in Italy. Yes, of course. And that's quite funny. Let's have a look uh, uh, to my front skin here in this case. So um, now it should look like meat sauce. And when I do this thing, noodles, spaghetti, spaghetti, meat sauce, meat sauce. spaghetti, meat sauce. <laughs> this is the only reason why I'm uh, having a board, but uh, that's another story. That's the only reason. Right? The only reason, yeah. <laughs> Shall we? Yeah, okay. Uh, what? Yeah. There's more cool stuff to come. Yeah, okay. Let's go on. Uh, let's go to real-time deepfake. So the first question is, anybody knows what a deepfake is? Yeah. All right. We know some people, but for the others, here you can also see a deepfake. So this is two times basically the same person. Uh, so we have Harald Lesch on the left, who is a German science guy, and Harald Lesch in the center as well. And w uh, the one in the center is really a deep fake. So we take the facial expression of a person and put another face on this person. And this is what we do. And we can do this in real time. So let's go through all the steps that are involved in creating such a deep fake. So first of all, of course, we have to grab the video frame from the camera. This is what we always have to do. Then next step is to do a face detection. So what we are doing here is basically an elaborated version of what you saw earlier with uh, this um, face detection har cascades, but now we're doing it with AI and with a library called MediaPipe. 
So with this MediaPipe library, we cannot just do a face detection, but we can do 368 points in the face, and we're adjusting this face mesh to Jonas's face, and with that we have a way more accurate face detection than we would have without this library. And this can, of course, be done in real time, so this is also very important. So let's go to the next step. So now that we have the face area in which our face is located, we now have to separate pixels. We have to separate the pixels that belong to the head, including hair, and uh, take them apart from the surrounding. So everything that's surrounding, that's not interesting to us at all. And we, are, we created our own little neural network here because there was nothing off, shelf, off the shelf that we can, could use. And as you can see, Jonas is not drowning or something. He is just uh, the, the blue color in his face is basically just all the pixels that belong to the head. So and this works pretty fine. It would, does not work perfectly. So if, uh, if you just uh, turn around a little bit, yeah. uh, the, the illusion will break a, li a little bit. So it will be pretty good still, but it does not know where the next starts and where the face ends really because we trained it with uh, people that didn't like to stare into the camera from the side, celebrities. So, um, so no joining the Blue Man Group for us. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. All right. And next one is uh, we need to eradicate the old face because we don't want the old face uh, to uh, parts of the old face uh, just blinking through uh, when we put on a new face. And this is something that uh, uh, that we have solved a long time ago uh, as humanity. It's, it's called inpainting, which is basically just removing scratches from images. And uh, we just take the surrounding pixels and fill them in. So J Jonas never looked better, so, um, as you can see. And it does not really look like he is completely gone, right? So, so <laughs> you can still imagine where the old face was. But this is not really important because we just want to um, delete some pixels which would shine through and this is normally just the outer boundary, which, uh, which is eradicated, which needs to be eradicated. So that's fine for us. And we said, okay, let's go on to the next slide. And here you can see um, a slide that didn't age that well. So we did this before the war, actually. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll just exchange that with just something more convenient. It. Yeah, okay, let's just yeah. let's try this. That's better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so now we'll have to put on the new face. And to put on the new face, um, we'll have to go into the theory a little bit more again. Let's have a look at it. So basically, we have, again, a bottleneck architecture like we had in the style transfer example. In this case, it's really an autoencoder. Uh, so it basically means uh, we take the image, we put it into the latent space representation like we did before. And then we try to decode it to the same image again. So in the latent space representation, we will have a compressed version of the face with features like, is the mouth open? Are the eyes open? Is the person smiling? Something like that will be, can be found in a well-trained um, autoencoder in this case. And then the decoder tries to reconstruct that and tries to output the same image again. At the beginning, of course, we have to help him. Again, we have a loss function here. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to do a pixel-wise comparison between the output and the input. And with that, we can train a neural network to give it an image, put it through a latent space representation, which is just a compressed version of the image, and then reconstruct the original image. So given an image of Harald Lesh, we get the same image again, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's pretty boring, but it gets interesting if we just take two of these autoencoders. And then we just take the image of Harald Lesch, we'll just uh, put that through our latent space representation, and then we are doing the trick. We are just taking the wrong decoder here, so the one uh, for Dirk Steffens, and we'll get the facial expressions that Harald Lesch is currently doing, but with the face of Dirk Steffens. And this is basically at the heart of this um, deepfake. 
So, and we are doing this live right now. So now you can see Jonas, uh, or you cannot see Jonas anymore, but you can see Brian, which is basically the How spokesperson of Fujitsu. <laughs> so Jonas, tell us a little bit does about Does he know yourself. that he's here? No, no, that, that's funny because <laughs> oh. once... We also have a couple of deepfakes of interns, like they, they stopped working at ours like a couple of years ago, but their deepfakes are still with us. That's pretty cool. We also have this person, like it's also just a guy who likes deepfakes. He, he was like, I'm going to send you my face, make a deepfake out of me. And we were like, sure, bro, let's do that. Uh, then <laughs> but course, actual people, uh, they want that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Then we, of, of course, have a couple of TV pr people. And the cool thing is like this deepfake really works for basically any kind of face that you put in there. So if you ever wanted to be... Uh, swap skin color, swap uh, gender, whatever. You can just do that in real time now. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Anything else about that? Yeah. What is about your version you've trained for you? Is it uh, in there as well? No, no, no. no. Ah, okay. Of course not. Um, okay, okay. So basically, their eyes are making funny things here, and this is due to lighting conditions because uh, we have uh, beams directly um, going towards uh, Jonas' face. So that's. Uh, a bit tricky for the deep fake. I don't know what you're on about. This is great. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, <keep it> <laughs> all things aside, like we, we saw how you can create art with AI. We saw how you can create deep fakes, which is the best thing ever. Now let's look at something completely different. Now let's look at natural language processing and the very important use case of shit posting AI. So first of all, let's talk about quickly what is natural language processing. Well, we're computer scientists. We like our Venn diagrams, and you can see NLP is just where linguistics and computer science meet. So that means whenever a computer is processing human language, language and be that written text or be that speech, that is natural language processing. And you can see you can do all kinds of stuff with, there, uh, with that. We have a couple of fields of applications that we listed here. But one very uh, good example is like all of you people have probably phones somewhere on your body right now. And in those phones, you probably have some kind of a voice assistant. And if you talk to that voice assistant, well, your voice is going to be translated to text by a text speech to text engine. And then that voice assistant is going to do, well, a bunch of stuff. It's going to try and figure out what you want to do. Maybe it might do a sentiment analysis on the text uh, to figure out uh, what mood you're in. Maybe it will extract keywords. Maybe it will summarize something, retrieve information, summarize that as well. And then finally read that text to you again. So all of that is kind of natural language processing, playing with natural language. And we want to do that with neural networks. The only big issue is, you saw previously, neural networks, they work with numbers. How do we put text in here? Well, in comes a technique that is called tokenization. For the sake of this example, let's have a look at the sentence, computer science is so, so nice. And what we want to do with the string now is we want to split that up into individual tokens. So becomes, instead of a string, it's now a sequence of tokens. For example, computer now is a token, science is now a token, and we assign these tokens a bunch of numbers. So now computer is 42, obviously, and uh, so becomes three. And um, mind you, both occurrences of so have the same token ID. And of course, we again have a demo for that as well. So what we can now do is we can live tokenize a sentence. Isn't that great? Um, so let's try this. London uh, has been great, and it deleted my input. <laughs> All right, and let's see. Running the, this sentence through it, and we can see it split up Joe into, or no, fuck, <laughs> it's called Joe. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. But you can see it split it up into two sub tokens. So it's J and L, and then exclamation mark. Simply because while well, the word Joe it doesn't exist, that's definitely not a conference. Yo, on the other hand, is a very great conference. Thanks for inviting us, by the way. And um, as opposed to, for example, a thing like London, that will be a word that will be used in common language quite often, that will be its own token. So that's pretty cool. Do we have another sentence? Oh, no, I think that's Okay, we're, we're, that's good. Fine. we're good. Yeah. Okay, we don't have that much time. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So now we have turned our text into numbers. So what we can do now is we can use those numbers and feed them in to the input layer of a neural network as we saw. So the only problem is we have sentences that might have different kinds of lengths. And so this one has, uh, let's see, five tokens. And let's say our neural network has an input vector of 16. 
So what we do now is we simply put our tokens in there and pad the rest with so-called padding tokens. And now we can do all the same that we did previously. We feed the input into the first layer, then into the second one. And then we might end up with a singular value that gives us the probability of that text being spam, for example. And that's basically how you do NLP. So if you have ever done anything with NLP, you know it's more complex than that. But we don't have the time. We have to talk about the shitposting AI right now. The most important, if I want you to take anything home today, shitposting AI is the best thing ever. <laughs> so, you might have thought to yourself at some point, well, you guys do, I don't know, art with, with neural networks and real-time deepfakes. There must be like a shit ton of... Uh, comments online. Yeah, right? there are a lot of comments yeah, online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like most of the time... No, it's really bad. Like, you can see this is just like one comment section of like one article that they wrote about us. And the, the thing with online comments is that most of them are not really too constructive. So we picked one out here that we can show to you today. Unfortunately, it's in German, but I'm just going to roughly translate it. Oh, the employees of TNG Consulting, which is not what we're called. But okay. Um, they taped the cams on their webcams, on the notebooks. Um, how I know that? Well, because everyone does that. I think we did the Amish people wrong. So if you know what this has to do with real-time deepfakes, please let us know because we don't know either. But <laughs> nonetheless, our typical reaction would be, well, to reply to that, to interact with those people and uh, do this a whole lot. And after a certain time, we noticed, well, this doesn't really scale too well. We spend way too much time discussing stuff online instead of doing some actual work. And we discovered another effect. Like every single time we reply, they reply. And then we thought about it for a while and, and came up with a concept that we call the shit posting circle jerk. And it looks something like this. So on the left side, well, on the right side, let's start with that, you have the typical troll on his PC. He's going to shit post something. And then you have the TNG giga, ner uh, giga chat that, is, that has to reply to that. Back comes another shit post and a reply from us, and that goes on forever and forever and forever. So we're a company, we typically do a lot of automation, so we thought to ourselves, hmm, <laughs> maybe we can automate that. So how about putting a bot in our stead here? We can do some actual useful stuff with our time now, for example, work, and the bot is just going to reply to the ship posters. Great idea, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. While we're at it, we, we might just go a step further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should take the human completely out of the loop. So now we have a floating NLP brain that is going to write the shit post and reply to it and discuss with itself in infinity. And then we can work, and even the shit poster can do something useful with his time, like, like learning about clean code. So that's amazing. So that was basically the idea for the shit posting AI. And we want to talk about now how exactly we pulled that off. So for a brain, for a floating NLP brain, we chose something that is called GPT from OpenAI. And GPT, that stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And we're just going to explain quickly what that means. Generative means, well, we generate text. We want to generate shit posts. Pre-trained means that, well, out of the box, it comes pre-trained on a huge data set from the internet. So that's kind of perfect. You're going to know it's going to know a bit about how a conversation works. And obviously, anything that it says is going to be true because it's from the internet. <laughs> and then we have the transformer part. That is basically the architecture of the neural network that makes it so special and so powerful. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Spoiler alert, it's not Optimus Prime. We just put that in for clickbait. So what does GPT do? It does a next word prediction. So we could just take a sequence of tokens, plug them in. In this case, we just have one word, computer. And GPT will do the following and will predict the next word. For example, science. What we can do now is we can take that output, plug it back into the input, run the thing again, and get the next word and the next word and the next word until we get an end of sentence token or end of text token. And that's basically when GPT tells us, well, I'm done, fam. And we know, OK, we're good. We have a sentence. Computer science is cool. We're all good. And how does GPT do that? We've seen GPT as this big floating black box. Let's have a look at what's so special about GPT and mostly the transformer part. Well, in the transformer, you have something that is called attention, an attention layer. And we want to briefly discuss how exactly attention works. And probably the best way to explain this is just remember the school days when you were in like a surprise exam, and you, which you didn't re really prepare for. So what do you do? Don't have any information that you need. 
So what you do is, well, you have a little peek around, have a look to your neighbors, see what kind of information they have, select the information that is most relevant to you, and then you combine that onto your sheet of paper. And that's exactly how an attention layer works. So let's assume we have an attention layer with the input he. What does he mean? We don't know unless we have a look at the surroundings. So now we can see, well, he um, kind of corresponds to, well, the shit poster who is mad. And so what the attention layer does now is it has a look backwards in this token sequence that it's seeing, selects, well, the most relevant words to understanding what he is, and that is, in this case, shit, obviously, poster, um, also mad, that's kind of important, and then he is incredibly important to understand what he means. And then we take that information, the weighted information, and we bundle that in the output of the attention layer. So now instead of he, we have shit poster mad he, which is quite frankly, not that amazing, but still way better than just having he. And the cool part about this is we now have like some kind of temporal context without really having all those weird RNN things going on, which means that we can still do things in parallel, which is going to be very important when we train our GPT to do shit posting in particular. Because it's trained on the general internet where there's Wikipedia articles and stuff like that. We don't care about that. We just want the shit posts. So we have to train it on our own data set. And that looks kind of like this. Uh, what you do is you just grab a random sequence from your data set. For example, your deep fakes are shit, end of common token, blah, blah, blah. And you plug that through GPT all in parallel because you can do that. And what it will do, it will come up with uh, well predictions for the next tokens based on what it saw previously. So for example, for your, we're on the internet, right? So it's going to predict mom. And uh, then for something like your deep fakes are, it's going to predict nice. And that's not exactly what we wanted to, 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 to tell us. So we have to kind of, again, train it. We have to kind of punish it with a cost function. And well, the cool thing is we know what the next token is supposed to be because we have it up there. We just have to shift it by one. So now we can compare our input versus what the GPT told us. We can see, oh, there are these words that are different, we can punish it for that, and this is the way that you train GPT in parallel. So it only comes down to finding a data set. So there's a couple of social media platforms that you could choose from to scrape your data. Uh, we chose Twitter and Reddit uh, just simply because they are probably the worst. And they also have pretty nice APIs for scraping anonymous data. And so obviously we also want the most loaded uh, discussions on there, so we chose to for example, scrape from r slash politics, change my view, unpopular opinion, shower thoughts, news, not the onion, political discussion, world news, and of course, mechanical keyboards. Because <laughs> that's going to be the best chip posting that we can find online. And then we took that data, we trained our chip posting in AI, and now we have that and can just start a random discussion. It's just going to load the comment generator. And what we can do now is we can just seed that conversation with basically any kind of topic that so we want. So you start with your topic, but in the meantime, the audience can think about a controversial topic or something like that. So please start with yours, Jonas. Yeah, let's let's take an all-time favorite, yeah. a very controversial topic. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, it's a classical one. Yeah. COVID is a thing. So now we're going to plug that into GPT and let's see what it comes up with. I'm so yeah. Cool. yeah. And, and you can see it's kind of interesting. They kind of all look legit. You just had like a Twitter link in there. Those Twitter links are completely made up. They're not going to point anywhere. And it's going to come up with basically all the good and bad arguments that you could find for or against any kind of topic. It's going to have basically all the kinds of characteristics that you will find on the internet, all the bad behaviors and bad opinions. So to, to, to summarize, this is perfect to put into production. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> does anyone have another topic that you want to have? To <laughs> does anyone have, have, to have a topic for us? Pineapple Sorry? pizza. You, oh, you got it? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. That's, that's very controversial. Yeah, uh, <laughs> let's see. Shit posting demo. Okay. We're just going to be starting it again. Because the thing is, if you don't like kill it, absolutely, it's just going to ramble on forever. Okay. Let's have a look. Uh, Jesus, how do you spell pineapple? All right, let's see. I hope, well, it doesn't matter. I'm on the internet. We're all friends there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. 
Okay, I have, a, <laughs> I have another one here. Because, <laughs> ah, okay, okay, yeah, we have a topic. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because that's a question from the audience, so why not let the robot answer that? Yeah. Yeah. We actually we're gonna come to that because that is not everything that we have because there's a bigger brother to what we have. Awesome. We just trained GPT two. It's like the small version, the small Keanu. There's also the bigger brother that you can't really train with your own data, but it's imagine take GPT two, make it bigger, train it for longer on more data. And now you have something that doesn't only um, deal with uh, next word prediction, but that has kind of learned how conversations, how question answering works on a meta level. So this is pretty cool because oh. you can now just ask it any kind of question. And so if we have a question from the audience, we can just ask GPT-3. Okay, um, so sorry, I know this is a serious question, so we might oh. have a proper answer to this okay. afterwards. But the, the question is, how do you protect identity in places where face recognition is used? Okay. Protect, okay, I'm just gonna summarize. Mm -hmm. How do you protect identity in places where face recognition is used? All right, so we're gonna give you a proper answer on. to that, but let's see what GPT has. Uh, there are a few yeah. ways to protect people from face identification. Wear a mask or disguise. Well, that's pretty cool. We can also just <laughs> Another ask. way is to keep your face hidden from cameras. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's correct. That's easy. But, <laughs> but it's not helpful. You <laughs> <laughs> can also just ask the stuff like, what's the weather in London? It's cloudy. Yeah. Does anyone yeah, know we have always the building all yeah. day? So <laughs> who cares? And uh, we have another question for GPT-3. Oh, that's good. That's good. Win the World Cup. Okay. There is no clear answer as the World Cup is a highly competitive event with many strong teams. However, <laughs> if we had to make a prediction, we would say that Brazil has a good chance of winning. <laughs> now you know. Now ah, you know. Yeah, okay. All right. With that out of the way, yeah. that is the big brother of GPT-2. Uh, if you want to play around with this, there's an open AI that you can use from open AI. <laughs> <laughs> and with that out of the way, you've seen everything that has to do with computer vision, you've seen everything that has to do with natural language processing. So let's conclude then, Martin. Yeah, yeah we asked the question here. Yeah, this, we have this chart here with the two AI winters and uh, we asked the question, yeah, brace yourself, winter is coming? Mm -hmm. That's the question. And of course, all those showcases we have seen today, you ask, yeah, where is the business case here? So there was a really good question about a GDBR conform camera surveillance. Oh, yeah. And that is so, so amazing. We just have a demo for you. Yeah, you can just... make a GDBR conform camera surveillance. So we spoke about real time deepfakes and the face segmentation. Why we don't use the segmentation for the whole body? Yeah, so that... here, let's have a look to this one. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to just segment the entire body instead of just the face. And what we can do now is, well, we can. For example, pixelate it, make it blue as well. And this way we don't have any problems with like personal information or whatever. And the cool thing is the network that we're running here is called mobile net unit. So you could run that on any kind of edge device, even on the camera itself. Yeah. And, and this a... is quite cool because <clears throat> we actually did that. No, okay, we did we, we tossed out that slide apparently. <laughs> what TNG did, we made a product that is called uh, what's it called? Oh Thomas, what is the name of that? Um, person <laughs> anonymizer or something like no, that. Uh, we, we built like a yeah. real thing. And, that and the idea is if you see suspicious, <laughs> if you Whatever. see suspicious behavior in the camera stream, you just can then uh, later uh, remove this segmentation. Yeah. And uh, this is some kind uh, of implementation which is already nowadays in production for a video camera surveillance system. Yeah, you um, can buy that today. Well, yeah. 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 But uh, yeah. let's have a look at another one. And this is, has to do with NLP because we've all seen automatic translators, but normally if you have automatic translators, then they send your information to the cloud and they also use it for training, which is maybe not what you want to do if you are a company and you want to protect your data. And this is why uh, we just thought, hey, there are good uh, free open source uh, translator neural networks out there and we could just use them and uh, put them into our own AWS accounts and make sure that nobody else gets that for training and this is what we did here and then we just created a Confluence plugin uh, so the Confluence is our wiki code base and with that uh, we could just translate it and as you can see in this 
Uh, example here, now we have uh, the German content and we just want to translate that to English. And if we do this, now we have the same content in English and uh, even the formatting is still there and uh, you can just use that right out of the box. And uh, this is wh why we thought, hey, this would be cool and we also released it. Um, and it's basically just a byproduct of our innovation hacking. So it just yeah. happened to happen. One of those sad moments where we actually make something proper. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> inconvenient, but... I mean, if you don't believe the business cases, maybe you want to believe the Gartner hype cycle that yeah. tells you AI definitely isn't dead. It's alive and kicking. You can see there's a bunch of different topics here that are all AI related, that are all kind of not dying right now. So that's pretty cool. And yeah. then we had a little... Deep, deep, there was even a hype cycle just existing for artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's amazing. Gartner made a hype cycle for AI. So I guess it's not dying. And you can see, well... Surprisingly, all of the topics are related to AI in here. Yeah, so That's pretty good. Yeah. Anyways, that out of the way, that's just a business talk that we have to do in the end. Now, there's one more thing that we want to close with today. And the, the thing yeah. that you're kind of all asking yourself right now, probably. Yeah. What happens if we let the past meet the present? So let's have a conversation between Eliza from 1966 with GPT-3. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can see they're kind of clicking, right? So so beautiful. <laughs> Do you want to add something to this discussion? No, I think we, we, we just, just watch and learn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the worst dating show I've ever watched. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, Jonas, tell us, what's going on here? Yeah, basically we told GPT to be a bit... No, we didn't do anything. There's just a standard network kind of <laughs> trying to hit on Eliza. That's all normal. We didn't do anything to it. <laughs> anyway, that's us. Thank you so much for your attention.